Good morning, RCC. How are we doing this morning? Awesome. Well, will you help me out? We're going to welcome the online church. We have people watching from all over the world tuning in online this morning. We help welcome them this morning. Awesome. Whether you're online or if you're in the room, we'd like to take, ask you to take a quick second before we get started. And if you're on Facebook, go to Facebook and hit the check-in button and let our community and let the world know that you're worshiping with us here at RCC this morning. It'll help us out a ton. We're getting ready to introduce a new song this morning. Uh, and I just want to share with you out of Romans 8, uh, where Paul is talking to the Roman church about the pain and the suffering that's, that's happening in the world, even then, now, and he uses the phrase that, that all creation groans and that, that because things are not right. Since sin entered the world, things aren't right. But he goes to Romans 8.31. We go to Romans 8.31, and he says, What then shall we say in response to all these things? He says, If God is for us, who can be against us? And so this song this morning, I'd like you to think about that as we move forward, that God is for us. No matter what's going on, we can put that aside, and we can worship him. Will you stand and sing with us? Oceans of kindness, wave after wave, mercy arriving again and again. Your love will find us, you're never far away. Battles behind us, battles ahead. God, you are for us, what stands against? We have this promise. You're never far away. We see your faithfulness in the darkest night. We see your goodness, God, favor on our lives. Everywhere we go, grace is on our side. Your grace is on our side. Battles are there, God, you are for us. What stands against? We have this promise, you're never far away. We see your faithfulness in the darkest night. We see your goodness, God, favor on our lives. Everywhere we go, your grace is on our side. Yeah, we were 
I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship. Turning lives around I worship you I worship you You are here Bending every heart I worship you I worship you, Lord We make a miracle work Keep it light in the dark stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working Stop, you never stop working Even when I don't feel that you're working
you may be seated. Good morning, RCC. It is uh, just this incredible privilege and honor to be with you uh, today. And we want to say thank you so very much for making the decision uh, to be with us. Whether you are here for the first time or you are a longtime member, uh, we just want to say thank you so much. And it is our sincerest hope and prayer and expectation that what you experience this morning will bless and encourage your heart. Most importantly, it is our sincere hope and prayer and expectation that everything we do would honor and bless the heart of God. Whether you've been here at RCC for a long time or a short time, we have phenomenal ministries and things taking place here. Zero Dark Early is making its return on Saturday, February 6th from 6 to 7 a.m. This is a time for men who are looking for other faithful, committed, and godly men to hang out with and also share some free, and I emphasize free breakfast. So uh, we want to encourage our men, young and old and in between, to come to this. Uh, you can pray together, hear from God's word as well. RCC also has an incredible preschool here Monday through Friday, and registration is officially open. So if you have kids ages two through five, and you're looking for wonderful opportunities for your kids to be loved on, to be encouraged, and to be taught about Jesus by some fantastic teachers, you can visit the preschool in person for more information, or you can go online to their Facebook page at River Pre-K. But we want you to know that the ministries that are taking place here and the magnificent things that are taking place here are only because of the Lord's extravagant generosity through each of you. So we want to encourage you to continue to give by going to riverchristian.church slash give, texting to give, mailing in your tithes and offerings, or putting those in the giving boxes as you exit. But we sincerely want to thank you in advance for all of the sacrificial ways that you're giving to impact the kingdom. On November 14th, 1960, a six-year-old little girl named Ruby Bridges walked into William France Elementary School in Louisiana. She was escorted by four federal marshals, becoming the first African-American student to desegregate the then all-white school. Bridges thought that the men and women outside the school screaming, yelling, and protesting her entrance into the school were actually celebrating Mardi Gras. All of the teachers in that school, with the exception of one, a Caucasian lady named Barbara Henry, refused to teach at a school where an African-American student was enrolled. Ms. Henry not only taught at that school, she taught Ms. Bridges for that entire school year. And for that entire school year, it was just Ms. Bridges and Ms. Henry, because no other parents desired their kids to be in a room with Ms. Bridges. About Barbara Henry, Bridges says the following, I remember the first day meeting her. She looked exactly like the mob outside the classroom, so I really didn't know what to expect from her. But I remember her graciously saying, come in and take a seat. And there I was sitting in an empty classroom with Ms. Henry for the entire year. She showed me her heart. She showed me her heart. What beautiful implications that continues to have for Ms. Henry and Ms. Bridges. We come to this time of communion together, all of us having different things in our past, wrestling with different things in our present, and wondering about our futures. And the beautiful and magnificent thing is that God has showed us and continues to show us his grace-filled and mercy-filled heart. God's heart shows us that we do have purpose. God's heart shows us that we do matter. God's heart shows us that we can be and are forgiven. God's heart shows us that we do belong but only because of his power and his provisions. In Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three, we are able to see that God has ultimately shown us his heart through Jesus Christ. Verse three says, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. In this time, 
that we are privileged to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. May we see God showing his heart to us. May we embrace God showing his heart to us. And may we be intentional in making sure that others see and experience God's heart through us. Please pray with me. Father, we are people who are incredibly grateful. We confess that you have shown us your heart and you continue to do that. And so, Father, we pray that you would increase our gratitude, you would increase our joy, that we get to see your heart, that we get to experience your heart. And Father, we thank you for Jesus who also shows us his heart. We thank you for the incredible love that Jesus has for you, that he would come to this earth, that he would walk the face of this earth selflessly and sacrificially. And Father, that he would die on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. So Father, in this time, help us to remember that the same power that you used to raise Jesus from the dead is the same power that courses through our veins as members of the body of Christ. As we take this bread and drink this cup, help us to remember the incredible love that you have for us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.
the day, you may have a seat. everybody doing today? Aren't you glad to be here? And it awesome being here together? It's awesome. <laughs> Love being with you. Hey, real quick, help me welcome all those who are online watching us right now, all over the place. Let's welcome them right now, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So glad to have you with us this morning. Hey, I want to encourage all of you online, but also those who are in the room, make sure that next week you go to riverchristian.church slash online if you are watching us online. We are taking, uh, we're moving away from YouTube, moving away from Facebook, and bringing everything together at one location. So all of our people are going to get together, have the best platform for viewing, for hearing, but also for interacting if they choose to at riverchristian.church slash online. So make sure you guys online go ahead and move in that direction to register if you will. Also, I'm excited because next week we're launching into a new series. We're going to take a break from our daily Bible just for one month. I'm launching a life-changing series called the ABCs of Financial Freedom. And I tell you what, it is amazing. If you haven't read this book, I've already had people stop me and said, I've already read the book and it's changed my life. I mean, seriously, that's what they say. In fact, once you hear from one of our own right now, Brian, he's going to tell us a little bit about it. Hey RCC, good morning, my name is Brian. I wanted to share how this book impacted me, the ABCs of Financial Freedom. I'm a banker, I'm all about a good book on finance, money management, but this book, this book is different. This book really tugged at my mind, it tugged at my heart, and it really got me in a good place where I better understand God's intent on how we're supposed to um, manage our money and God's expectations on how we're supposed to manage our money. This book is direct. This book is bold. Um, This book made me uncomfortable at times, and that's okay. Um, Being uncomfortable is good. That's where our faith can grow. That's where our obedience can show. So, you know, I've made some changes. I've made some adjustments. I'm really looking forward to seeing what God has in store. I would encourage you to um, please embrace this book and its concepts and um, be prepared to be blessed and be prepared to be a blessing to others. Thank you. Can we give it up for Brian and how God has moved in his life? Brian was so excited about it. He had to talk to me about it. Took me out for lunch, which was a great win for me too. All right, I got a free lunch out of the deal. And he's like, I got to tell you how this book changed my life. And so we are going to give you the book today. If you haven't gotten it, we're going to give it to you. It's a gift to you because it's going to help you, as Brian said, to be a blessing and you to bless other people in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here. That's why we're walking right now on this planet. And so uh, we want to help you with that. And so we're going to give you that. We're going to start the series. Invite a friend, man. Invite a friend. Even you guys online, you can invite somebody to join with you. I'm telling you, it will change your life. And many people will be blessed because of what's going to happen during our time. And Barry Cameron, uh, my friend who wrote the book, is going to be with us the very last week of the series. And he's from Texas. And we'll tell you more about Barry uh, as we move into February. And you know, right now we're in our daily Bible reading. And I tell you what, it's been amazing. I hope you've been blessed by daily Bible reading. And today we're in the Ten Commandments. Who's pumped about the Ten Commandments, all right? We're going to dive the Ten Commandments today. Don't you wish there was 15 commandments? Well, I don't know if you knew this, but maybe that happened. Check out this video, see what happened after Moses got the 15 commandments. Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. All pay heed. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah has given unto you these 15. Ten, ten commandments for all to obey. 
All right, so that's how we ended up with Ten Commandments there. Love that video. You know, you uh, maybe watch the Ten Commandments every Easter on Sunday night, and, and you kind of go, well, how in the world did the Israelites end up in Egypt? We talked about that last week. If you missed last week, make sure you go back and watch. You go to riverchristian.church slash rewind, or you can go to our messages and listen to it while you're traveling. And Joseph, we talked about Joseph. Joseph was sent, actually by God, whether he realized it or not, to Egypt. And there, after many many trials, he rose up to the second most prominent place in the world. And because of that, many people were blessed and and they multiplied and multiplied in Egypt and they reached about two million people. And then they're enslaved by Pharaoh and finally God raises up a deliverer named Moses. And this is where we're at in our daily Bible reading. The children of Israel are delivered out of Egypt by Moses. And while Pharaoh for him to have a change of heart, God sent 10 plagues. And I tell you what, the last one, the final plague was the worst, worst one of all. The death angel passed over, killed, killed the firstborn of every family, unless they had the blood of a lamb, innocent lamb, over the door frames of their homes. And if they had that over the door frames of their homes, the angel, the angel of death would pass over. So the Israelites were spared, but Pharaoh and many families were not spared. And finally, what happens, Pharaoh just says, Go. Go, y'all leave. Everybody just go. Please go. The Egyptians are so happy to get rid of the Israelites that they give them jewelry. They give them gold. And, and, and then the Israelites come to the first obstacle called the Red Sea. They turn around. They see that actually Pharaoh has changed his mind. And now he's in hot pursuit of the Israelites with his whole army. They look back and they see the, the, the Egyptians behind them. They see the Red Sea in front of them. And they cannot go over it. They can't go around it. They can't go under it. They're stuck. And then God does a miracle, another miracle. He parts the Red Sea. And then the, the Israelites walk on dry ground and while the waters parted, and they make it across, but right as they're looking back, they see all of a sudden the Egyptians have changed their mind. They, they, they now are diving into the Red Sea as well. They're walking on the dry ground in hot pursuit of the Israelites. And then God has the Red Sea come over them and wipe out the entire Egyptian army. And then we see God do more miracles where he provides for the Israelites. He gives them quail. He gives them manna so they can, so they can eat. And then he gives them a guide by a pillar, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And God continues to be with his people. Three months go by and they end up at a mountain. It's called the Mount Sinai. And, and you could think of this as you would think, you know, this is a pretty good place to end the story. Like right here, yes, they're free. God wins. Everything is perfect. And they live happily ever after. That's what you would think. God says, nope, nope. I'm going to share with you a good bit of information right now that is important for you to understand. And God says, now, now I'm going to choose to live with you. And you might be thinking, I thought he was. Well, God was with his people Adam and Eve, but they sinned and it separated him from his people, separated him from the people that he loves. And so God is working throughout human history trying to get back in a relationship with you and with me. But sin has separated us and that's what happened when Adam and Eve sinned and he has not been dwelling with his people. And now God has been interacting with people. He's interacted with Noah and Abraham. He's interacted with, with Moses, but God has not been dwelling with them. And that leads us to this big takeaway for today, and here it is. More than interacting with you, more than being near you, God desires to live in you. God wants to be in you. The first step that God was going to take towards his people as he has not been with them, now he's going to be with and among them, to live with them, was to say, I'm going to come near you, I'm going to dwell among you, and God says, I'm coming down there, <laughs> I'm coming down with you, but before I do, there's going to be a couple of things that happens before I come and live among you. And so God invited Moses to come up Mount Sinai and, and to verbalize the Ten Commandments. And here's what happens. In Exodus 20, it says this, And when the people saw the thunder and the lightning and they heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and, uh, and smoke, they trembled with what, church? They trembled with, with fear and they stayed they stayed far away a great distance they said to Moses hey hey Moses you speak to us and we will listen <laughs> but do not have God speak to us or we will what we will die and God says, I want to have a town hall meeting, but it goes rogue because the people are like, no, 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 no. Moses, you go because if we're around God, he's too great. He's too wonderful. He's too awesome. We're going to die. 
And so Moses and Aaron, what they do is they walk up the mountain amongst the smoke and amongst the fire and amongst the lightning and amongst the thunder. And they go up and God verbalizes the Ten Commandments along with giving other important guidelines. Of, and, and eventually Moses comes down the mountain. He shares the first four. I want you to notice the first four Ten Commandments. They have something in common. Here's what it is. You shall have no other gods before me. You, number two, you shall not have any idol to worship. Number three, you shall not misuse my name. Number four, you shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And I want you to notice these first four, what they have in every one of them is a vertical relationship. It's about you and God. It's about your relationship with God. But the next six are different. They're more horizontal. It's about how you relate with one another. Look what the next six say. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not lie. You shall not covet. And the people are thinking, you know, when they hear this from Moses, he's, he's sharing these commands and they're thinking, man, that's cool, no problem. That makes complete sense and that will make life better. In fact, before they got the Ten Commandments, here's what they say with one voice. They say this to Moses, everything the Lord has said, we will do. I want us all to say that together right now on the count of three, all right? Let's say it together like lions. One, two, three. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. One more time. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. See, God always keeps his covenant. He always does. He told Abraham, I'm going to make you into a mighty nation. Well, guess what happens? He, he, did, he did that. At this time right here in Exodus, the mighty nation that came out of Abraham is two to three million strong. And now God is saying, I want you to make a covenant with me. God is going to move in. He's saying to his people, we're going to have to have some house rules. I'm going to live together with you. And if that's going to happen, there's got to be a covenant. There's got to be an agreement. See, what God's people need, they need a blueprint. They need a blueprint to follow. Now, this is strange because Israel thinks like God is moving into their house in some ways. And when I was um, uh, trained to be a, a pastor, I go to college, and then when I had an opportunity in the summers, I would go live uh, in another city to work in another church. And you always, because we're you know don't have any money, you'd always live with a sweet couple that would house you know a college kid like myself to work with this church. And, and you know, when you're, when you're living in someone else's house, you try not to cause any waves. You, you try to clean your room, keep your bed made, you know, do all the things your mom told you to do that you didn't do. You know, you try to do those things. You try to be helpful around the house when it's somebody else's house. Can you imagine as I was staying at this sweet couple's house, the college kid, and I come in and, you know, I'm going to stay there for two months. These people are going to love on me for two months. Can you imagine if I went in there and said, hey, okay, let's get some things straight. Here's some rules if I'm coming to your house. Number one, don't touch my stuff. Number two, all right, just want to say this, never enter my room. Number three, if you want to talk to me, what you do is you write on a white piece of paper and then you write it in blue ink and then slip it underneath the door and then I'll read it, but I don't want to see your face. Can you imagine how that would have gone? It would have been a short internship is what would have happened, right? I mean, they'd be like, this is our house. Like, what are you doing? Setting the rules. This is our house, right? And, and, and you know, here's what God is saying. He says, Israel, I'm moving in, and here are some rules. And, and Israel's going, uh, God, um, you're moving in with us? You're setting the rules? Like, that, what? And God says, oh, I didn't tell you that the earth that you're on, like, uh, that one's mine. Like, I made that. that. The mountain you're by, I, I made that too. Your bodies that you have, I gave them to you, all right? And so he's saying, you know what? Actually, you're in my house. You're in my house. And many parents of teenagers have said this before. They've said, as long as you're living in my house, you'll follow and obey whose rules? My rules, right? And that's what God's saying. So God says, Moses, come back up the mountain, hang out with me. Now I'm going to have, I'm going to write these commandments and you're going to go down and share them with the people. But Moses knows that the children of Israel, they need a babysitter. And so he leaves with them his brother Aaron. And so Aaron's left behind while Moses goes up the mountain. And Moses goes up there for a while. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, guess what's taking place? The people of Israel are getting a little antsy. 
And they start just kind of, it's like a kid on a trip. I mean, you left the driveway and they're already asking, hey, when are we getting there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And it's kind of what's going on here. They're like, hey, when's he getting back? When's Moses getting back? When's he getting back, Aaron? Is he not back yet? Is he alive? Is he dead? When's he getting back? This goes on week after week after week after week for 40 days until Moses comes back down the mountain and they start to doubt God's plan. And so it got crazy. Look what happened here in Exodus chapter 32. We've read this this past week. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, a lot of pressure here, and said, come, make us what, church? Make us gods who will go before us as for this fellow, your brother Moses, who brought us out of Egypt. We don't know what happened to him, Aaron. Isn't this amazing? These people have just said, everything the Lord has said we will do are already breaking the first two commandments. I have no other gods before us and make no other idols. And Aaron said, hey, they said, Aaron, you know, Moses, your brother's dead. He's gone. So we got to do something like we want a God like right now. And Aaron, Moses' brother, who's been with Moses every step of the way, who was there when God said, read my lips, no other gods. Aaron says, okay. And what happened is they bring out all the gold the Egyptians gave the Israelites. They made a golden calf. And Aaron says, this is your God and you will worship this God. And the Bible talks about how they break out in a party. Like they had this drunken feast. They party like it's 1999 or 1296 BC or whatever. They, it's like Woodstock on steroids. And this is why we call them the children of Israel because they act like four-year-olds. And God says to Moses up on the mountain, Houston, we have a problem. I need you right now to go down there because the very people I just delivered have forgotten about me. It's like, how does this happen? How does this happen? Well, remember that they have lived in Egypt for many years. And God had, I mean, the Egyptians had many, many gods. They had gods like the raw God, which was the God of the sun. They had the God of the, the Nile River. They had Kermit the Frog God. They had all kinds of gods. And they have been around lots of gods. The children of Israel have been for a long time. And now they see this as their chance to make their own God. And they were just about to receive the commandments about having no other gods and making no idols. And now Moses starts down the mountain. When he walks down the mountain halfway down, he kind of starts seeing and sensing what's going on. He, he hears the drums. It's getting wild down there. He sees the golden calf. In a fit of rage, he becomes the only person to break all ten commandments in one second. Because he throws them all down. He just throws them down, they shatter, and he confronts his brother Aaron about everything. And then Moses is given the most lame excuse in the history of humanity. Look at this. It's what the Bible says. Moses says to Aaron, so, um, so Moses, I told them, uh, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. And then they gave me the gold, I threw it in the fire, and then out came this calf, man. It was crazy. And it sounds like a six-year-old's manufactured the worst lie he could do for his mom. Mom, I don't know what happened. It just kind of came out. And we laugh at that because it's so ridiculous. But let's be honest. The truth is, is our own idols, our own idols. We have our own lives that are wrapped around justifications and, je and wrapped around excuses and rationalizations. And as soon as I brought up idols, probably something came to your mind. But then as soon as it came to your mind, you started pushing it out of your mind because you thought to yourself, I don't, I don't worship an idol. I don't have an idol. I'm not an idol worshiper. And that's why you need to listen to the very first part of your mind. For some of you, it might be materialism. Materialism, all of a sudden, is taking the place of God in your life. For some of you, it might be pleasure. And pleasure is taking the place right now of God in your life. For some of you, it might be relationship uh, with a person, real or imagined. It takes obsessive amount of your time, obsessive amount of thoughts. My wife can be my idol if I make her more important than he is. You, you may be single. A quest for romance may be your idol. We mistakenly think that a relationship with a person can take the place of God. For some of you, it might be your body. You worship at the cathedral called Planet Fitness, all right? Now, I just mentioned four, 
And I would say this, none of them are wrong in and of themselves unless they take the place of God in your life. Anything can become an idol. Anything can if it takes the place of God. And here's what Psalm says. It says, they worship the golden calf because they what church? They forgot God. They just forgot him. And that's why in the whole Bible, God is saying, remember, 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 remember. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, therefore, my dear friends, flee, not play or flirt with. He says, flee from idolatry, run from it. So what in the world does Paul, do? I mean Moses do? What he does, he melts the golden calf down and then he puts it in the water supply. And what happens is he makes every person drink it and they look like this, I imagine. You know, when they drink, they drink what they drink. It's kind of the equivalent, the ancient equivalent of having your mom wash your mouth out with soap is what I think this is. Do you know why I think he made them do this? I think he's saying, you think this satisfy? You think that, the, that this is, fills the deepest hunger of your soul? All right, then just drink it down and see if it satisfies the deepest need in your soul the way that God does. And so Moses has to go back up the mountain. He has to replace the original Ten Commandments with a whole new Ten Commandments. It's the exact same list, just the different tablets. And God gives it to him so he can give it to the people. And I just want to say this, before we're too hard on Aaron... Before we're too hard on the Israelites, I want to go through each one of these Ten Commandments and I want you to ask yourself, even you guys online, which one of these ten have you not broken? Out of the Ten Commandments, which ones of the ten have you not broken? So it's a little survey to see how good we really are. So you keep count. You keep your own score. Don't keep your spouse's score, okay? You keep your own score. This is kind of a spiritual health check and see how well you do. Which one of these have you not broken? Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. So you've always kept God number one in your life and nothing has come between you and God. Not money, not sex, not a person, not a hobby, you know, not family. God has always been number one in your life. You can count that as one that you've never broken. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. So you have never carved out a graven image and bowed down to it in your backyard. Then you can count that as one you've never broken. Aren't you glad that one's in there? Hopefully all of us have one now, all right? Number three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God in vain. So you've never used the name of God, the name, name of Jesus Christ in a flippant or vain way. You've never texted OMG on your phones. Then you can count that as one you've never broken. Number four. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So you've, you've been in worship every time you're supposed to be in worship. You've always been in worship. You've never skipped church because you want to sleep in or watch a ball game. And you've, when you did show up to church, you always kept focus and, and on everything the pastor said. And you can count that as one that you've never broken. Number five, honor your father and mother. So when you were a kid, you always obeyed your parents, your mom and your dad. You never made fun of their clothes behind their back, all right? As you've gotten older, you always speak respectfully of your parents. You never complain about them. Then you can count that as one that you've never broken. Number six, you shall not murder. Now, in the New Testament says that if you have anger in your heart towards a brother or sister, then you, Jesus says, you've committed murder in your heart. But um, I'll leave it up to you how you want to count this one. I, how about this? I'll help you out. If you have never killed anyone, all right, then you can count that as one you never broke. And number second, number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus, once again, he ups the ante. He says, you know, if you've lusted in your heart, then you committed adultery in your heart. But I, I won't count it that way. If you've never committed adultery, you can count that as one that you've never broken. Number eight, you shall not steal. So you've never taken something that didn't belong to you. You never took a dollar out of your mom's purse when she didn't know about it. Like you never, you never stole, a, you know, answers from a kid's test when you were in school or you're in school right now. Let me put it this way. You have no holiday end towels in your house, all right? All right, if that's you, you can count that as one that you've never broken. Number nine, you shall not give false testimony. So you've never lied. 
You've never lied. You've never said anything that wasn't true. Never told your mom, hey, I'm going over here, but I really went over there. Never been dishonest on your tax forms or IRS. Uh, you never, you've always been up front with them. You've never said to anyone, man, you look great in that outfit when really they look terrible, all right? You've never done that before. You've never said anything that you knew wasn't true. You can count that as one you've never broken. Number 10. Many of you are like, thank God, he's finally wrapping this up. You shall not covet. You've never wished you could have something that belonged to somebody else. You never wished you could have somebody else's car or somebody else's job or somebody else's spouse or house or family. Then you can count that as one that you've never broken. All right, so do you have your number? You have your number of how many of the Ten Commandments you have not broken. So let's kind of find out here. Who in here has kept all Ten Commandments? Raise your hand if you kept all Ten Commandments really high because we want to worship you. All right, where are you at? Are you in here? Nobody here, okay. How about nine? Anybody kept nine out of the ten? That's a, that's a 90%, all right? So that should be a B, but now an A in our education system, all right? So, um, all right, so you have apparently a, an A. Um, how about eight? Anybody have an eight? Seven, any seven, six, six? All right, you are a wicked church. Goodness gracious, y'all are. Now, I'm not gonna go any lower than that. Many of you right now are getting really nervous. You're like, how low is he gonna go, all right? I'm not, I'm not gonna go any lower. Um, I, I figured the way that I went through them, I've kept three. I've never made a graven image, all right? And the other two are none of your business, all right? I'm not saying, I'm not telling you people. Look what Paul says. Paul says years later when he wrote Romans, here's what he says. Therefore, no one, no one. I mean, we don't have people that, that score a high F in here. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. No one will be declared righteous by keeping the Ten Commandments. Here it is. Rather though, through the law, we become, what we become? We become conscious. We become conscious of our sin. God didn't give us Ten Commandments to make us better people. He gave us Ten Commandments for us to realize how much we are in need for grace he made us, we realize how much grace we need. You see, the, the law is like a mirror. We look in the mirror to kind of see how we look. How many of you guys uh, looked at a mirror this morning? Raise your hand if you looked at a mirror. Some of you really needed to look at a mirror, all right? So we all look in a mirror, why? We all look in a mirror to basically kind of go figure out how we look. We wake up to see, when we wake up in the morning, we look at a gruesome sight, right? Our hairs, bedhead, not, not mine, but yours, I mean mine. Um, you, I, I need to put makeup on. But here's the thing, you never take a mirror and comb your hair with a mirror. You never take a mirror and put on makeup with a mirror. The mirror helps you see who you really are. That's the law. The law doesn't make us better. The law helps us see who we really are. And you're going, why is it so important? It's because we're going to read today in our daily Bible reading, Exodus 34, it says this. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is what, church? The Lord whose name is jealous. Is a jealous God. Why is that? Because he wants your heart. He wants your attention. God wants your, all of your affection. Your salary cannot be more important than he is. Your house cannot be more important than he is. Your family cannot be more important than he, he is. Your viewing of a sport team cannot be more important than he is. They need our prayers, don't they? They need our prayers big time. More than interacting with you, more than being near you, God wants to live in you. So he gives the Israelites this mirror, right? these house of rules to follow. And the next thing he gives them is a place for God's spirit to dwell. God says, I'm coming down there. I need a place to stay. Here's what he says in Exodus 25. Then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle, all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. God has given them some holy rules and now he's saying, I need a holy room. And this is a beautiful tent called a tabernacle. It's an RV, like an RV for God and God to dwell and making their way as the children of Israel, making their way to the promised land. And inside of this is the Ark of the Covenant. It's a box and in it, if you've seen the Indiana Jones movies, all right, in it has, a, has the Ten Commandments and other important things. And the question I have is, do you know where God told them to set up the tabernacle? 
You know where God told them to set up the tabernacle? He says, right there, right there in the middle of the community. Because the Israelites would have said, hey God, we're going to put you out there by the mountain. Because you know what? You're too intimidating. You're too awesome. You're too great. If we're around you, we're, gonna, we're just going to, we're going to die. But God says, no, 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 no. I want you, when you set up camp, I want the tabernacle and then everything else built around that. God is saying, I want to be among you. I don't want to be out in the garage. I don't want to be out in the mother law suite. I want to be right there, smack dab in the middle of the family room, living with you. And you might be asking, oh, why, why does this relate to us? Like, how does this connect with us today? I'm glad you asked. Every page in this book is God's passionate desire to be with you. God wants to be with you. God doesn't just want to be near you. He doesn't want to be just among you. God wants to be in you. In the New Testament, through Jesus, we get what the Israelites did not get. We don't just get God with us or among us. Through Jesus, we get God living in us through the Holy Spirit. Amen, church? That's why Jesus came. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. And those who put the blood of Jesus over the door frames of their hearts, what happens is judgment passes over. Today, God is not living in a traveling tent anymore. He's not living in a temple made by human hands. He's not living in a church building. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, I'm telling you right now, God lives in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But God being the perfect gentleman does not barge in. He waits for you to invite him in. You know what I'm wondering today? I'm wondering who's on the Lord's side. Who's on the Lord's side? I'm wondering who will say everything the Lord has spoken, I will do. Everything the Lord has spoken, I will do. In the Psalms, it says that the Israelites traded, they traded the Lord their God for a bull that eats grass. What a stupid trade. You would think nobody has made as bad a trade as Aaron did on that day. You traded the glorious God for a cold metal cow. But let's be honest, we do the same thing. If you choose, and oftentimes we do, we choose a relationship, money, friendships, we trade in for our relationship with God, we trade we, uh, family, I want to worship family, I want to worship a hobby. If you do that before the perfect God of the universe, the one who loves you unconditionally, who gave you his perfect and one and only son, that's a messed up trade. Don't choose anything over the unconditional love of God. Amen, church? Don't do it. And yet the Israelites who say, you know what, we praise you one day and then live like the devil the next, they make foolish trades and we do as well. And I'm wondering today, I'm wondering who is ready to say everything the Lord has spoken, I will do. Because he, our holy God, doesn't want to just live near us or among us. He wants to live inside of us by his Holy Spirit. So everything the Lord has spoken, my question to you is why wouldn't you do? And so right now, we're getting ready to pray. And during this prayer, if there's some idol right now that's causing you to have a separate relationship, causing you to have to work around to get to God, I'm going to ask you to remove it. And here's how you do that. You can pray to God right now and say, God, I'm handing over this idol. Maybe it's your kids. I mean, you're so focused on your kids and you, make, you never make time for God. I want to tell you right now, you want to be a great parent, you be an amazing disciple of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's your job. It's just been over-consuming. God, I'm going to put that second, I'm going to put that way back and I'm going to put you number one. Maybe right now it's your health. Maybe right now it's some other relationship. Maybe it's anxiety, a concern, an addiction, a sin. Whatever it is right now, I want to ask you to pray to God and say, God, I hand this over to you. I'm not making a stupid, foolish trade like Aaron did. I'm going to make a trade that's going to change my life and change the life of everyone for all eternity around me. 
Today, if you want to respond to this message, and you can say, I'm handing over my idol to God, you can take it to the cross during the song. Maybe you can write a prayer. If you have a prayer right now, you need to lift up, take it to the cross. We'll pray for that. Maybe today, you want to give your life to Jesus Christ and say, you know what? I am going to allow the blood of Jesus to cover my heart so that judgment passes over, and I will have life for all eternity. Maybe that's you today. Why don't you make that choice today? So will you please stand? Please stand right now as you are considering making that choice of handing over that idol right now. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come before you. And Lord, many of us right now have been distracted all week long, all month long because of an idol. Lord, maybe it's just being so hung up right now on what's going on in the world and we tend to focus more on that than we do you. Lord, maybe right now it's, 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 a, it's a temptation that, Lord, we just can't seem to kick. Maybe it's a relationship within the family, outside the family. Maybe it's a job. Lord, we're people pleasers. Lord, I don't know what it is. Codependent. And maybe it's uh, something else, Lord. Anger. But, Lord, we allow that thing to come in between you and us. And so, Lord, right now we remove that idol and we hand it over to you. We ask for you. To have your way as we focus on you first and, and foremost in our lives. Lord, may we cast out all idols, Lord. It's just our heart. We tend to go towards idols. When we cast out all idols, it has to be a decision. Help us to be proactive and do it right now, God. What is that idol? And why wouldn't we right now say to you, whatever you speak, God, we will do. And Lord, if that means casting out the idol, we'll do it. Because we know your love is better than life. Lord, thank you so much for taking these idols from us. And God, help there be nothing to separate you and us. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. The whole church said, amen. So if you want to respond right now, you can take and move to the cross with whatever it is right now that's on your heart. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. But let's do it right now. As we talk about the one thing we're going to do, we're going to build our life on Jesus Christ. of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none Inside you, open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. It's
right, sing with me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken and It's amazing how much God wants us and how he's willing to come our way. And I hope that you have made some step toward God today. I want to say I love this family. I love doing life with this family. One of the ways we do life is we have fun together. We're having a kickball game today at 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. You want some entertainment? Watch some middle-aged guys play kickball with some kids, all right? Bring the cameras. There's going to be some incredible footage today. And so be there at 3. It's going to be right here on our property. And we would love Love to have you and your family bring the lawn chairs and I uh, tell you what we're going to celebrate just God's goodness having some fun together today and once again I told you about that gift and we want to give it to you if you have not received it ABC to financial freedom make sure you pick it up it's a life-changing gift and uh, people are going to hand it to you on your way out the door and I want to ask you invite your friends invite your family this series is going to change your life I promise so be here and don't forget keep reading the daily bible if you want one of those bibles you can pick up one outside at the River Life table. And also, hey, we have to hand out magnets. Our friends in West Virginia even have magnets on their cars, all right? I think as Floridians can do this. And it helps us get the word out about Jesus Christ because RCC is all about Jesus. So take one of those magnets at the Welcome Center. And if you see somebody out there that doesn't have a magnet on their car, just throw it on there, all right? You have my blessing, all right? I want to give you the blessing here is may the Lord continue to bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to make his face shine upon you with favor and give you peace. May the Lord continue to be gracious to you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we love you, RCC. Have a blessed day. God bless. We'll see you next week, all right?